this is Ahmed. He uh, actually is joining Cornell next year, uh, I guess in January, and maybe teaching a, a PhD topics course, which is going to be cool. Hopefully we can coordinate on both of our uh, topics courses that semester. So that's sort of the, the preliminary plan. But um, right now he's coming to us from Berkeley as a postdoc at the Simon Center um, for the program on high dimensional probability, I guess, mm -hmm. in computation. Yeah. 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 So uh, exciting program. I actually know a few people there too. So that's great. Um, and before that, I guess your postdoc with um, Andrea Montanari at Stanford. That's right. And a couple of years ago, you were back at Berkeley with um, Michael Jordan. So that's right. Just a very quick round trip there, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just, awesome. uh, yeah. So um, Ahmad today is going to talk to us about um, optimization and sampling from random quadratic potentials. Thank you, Daymac, for the invitation, and thanks, Sid, as well for the talk, for for the our discussion and everything. Um, yeah, I'm happy to give this talk here at the colloquium of the Ori department. So today I'll be talking about um, optimization and sampling from random quadratic potentials. All right. So. All right, so the two main uh, questions that I'll be uh, discussing today are optimizing highly non-convex or combinatorial functions. And the second topic is sampling from high dimensional distributions. So these two are very relevant to practice, but uh, from a worst case point of view, from a worst case theory that tells you that most interesting problems where one of these two questions is involved is RNP hard, so what do we do? So that doesn't stop practitioners to uh, still try to solve these problems on a daily basis. And uh, even there is prevalence of non-convexity with large numbers of parameters, for instance, uh, our favorite example would be deep learning, for instance, or Bayesian sampling from posteriors for a statistician. And these large instances, as I said, are routinely solved with various heuristics. So why is that the case? Um, so maybe because real world instances are rarely worst case. The, re the worst case analysis does not reflect at all uh, the kind of typical instances that we encounter in, in, in real world. And also because it's the real world, the data comes, that come in, that's coming at us from nature has noise in it and randomness is, has probably a smoothing effect. Okay, so this motivates really the kind of research that I try to do is, can we understand average case instances? Can we understand their computational difficulty? Can we design efficient algorithms that you can actually implement in a computer in order to solve them? And also, can you really analyze them theoretically and prove bounds on them through prove uh, mathematical theorems about them? So today I'll focus on simple models where really the success of these heuristics is really not explained by, by any obvious structural property. Like there are certain problems where they, they have certain structural properties that will make it immediately obvious that the usage of a certain algorithm will work and some of those are actually the uh, problems that are tried, solved in practice. But here I'll focus on certain models that are just completely random and disordered and whether the heuristic succeeds or not, if it succeeds, it is really not clear why it does so. And we would like to elucidate that kind of mysterious hidden structure that allows these heuristics to, to, to succeed. Okay, so the outline of the talk is twofold. So I'll talk about sampling from this very nice model, famous model that is called the Schering and Kirkpatrick model. And uh, in the second part of the talk, I'll consider the problem that is um, so-called at zero temperature, which is the problem of just trying to approximate near optima of these functions, which are random. And I'll, general, I'll try to generalize to actually random functions beyond the Schering and Kirkpatrick model. Okay. So let me start with the first part of the talk. Okay, so let me define the model. So here I have a matrix M that is given to me. It's called the interaction matrix. It's a symmetric and it's a random matrix that, is, that has entries that are normal of mean zero and various beta squared over N. So the over N here is just for scaling so that everything is at order one. Beta is a free parameter that is called the inference temperature and I can change it however I want. It's a positive number. Okay, so when I construct this, this, uh, this probability measure, which for, so it's on the hypercube and it associates to every point sigma in the hypercube, this inner product, this quadratic form, okay? So mu favors vectors or configurations, we call them configurations with low energy. So the lower this inner product is, this quadratic form is, the higher the weight that is put by mu on that point. 
So it is known from statistical physics and later proved mathematically that um, there is a phase transition in this model. So for beta smaller than one, this is called the high temperature phase. And uh, if, so this is, there are many ways to characterize it, but perhaps this is the most relevant one. If you sample two independent copies from mu, which are independent, and you look at their inner product and normalize it by n, then you converge to zero. So this inner product will obey a certain lar of large numbers because the average of each one of these guys is zero. This will obey a large a law of large numbers and this inner product will go to zero. So you can, you can say that the model is in the high temperature phase actually if this is true. So you can take this as a definition. And in this case, the model has simple characteristics. You can compute its partition function. It has a simple form and so on and so forth. The model is in a simple phase. On the other hand, if beta is greater than one, then this is called the low temperature, the spin glass phase. If you still do the same experiments and you look at this normalized inner product, this will not converge to zero. In fact, it will not converge to any deterministic constant. It will converge to a non-trivial random variable that we can understand, but it is still rather non-trivial and it's not described by anything that is simple. And I'll talk about, come back to this point a bit later. So in this, the uh, spin glass phase, the problem is that the structure of, the, of this Gibbs measure is highly complex. And there is a sophisticated mathematical descript description of all the relevant quantities or the, the relevant physical observables that one might care about in terms of this mathematical description that is called the Parisi formula. And I'll come back to that a bit later. But for this for first part of the talk, I'll be only interested in the high temperature phase in beta smaller than one. Okay, so I'm interested in sampling from mu, or at least having an algorithm that efficiently samples from something that is approximately like mu. Okay, so the first observation is that mu is not log concave. In fact, if you look at the eigenvalues of this matrix, since it is a random matrix, it's Gaussian, it has a Wigner semicircle law in terms of this eigenvalues, the density of the eigenvalues looks like this. And it, so the eigenvalues are of both signs. So it's not, it's not, it's very far from being log concave. So what can we do in order to sample from it? So yeah, the first heuristic or the algorithm that, that uh, you might think of, if you, you're familiar with thinking about uh, Markov chains, is the following, it's called Gibbs sampling of Glover dynamics. And so you start with a configuration that is uniform on the hypercube. And at time t, you just choose a random index uniformly at random and you update that coordinate. So you sample a spin, epsilon that is plus minus well from, from the conditional distribution on the current vector of signs that you have, the current configuration. And so you condition only condition on all the entries except the ith one. So you resample the ith one, okay? And then you set it up that, this way. So the next configuration is just whatever you got from this resampling. And then the other co coordinates remain unchanged. And so this step, step three is perhaps the non-trivial one. And it turns out that step three, just if you just do Bayes rule or just try to do elementary probability, you'll see that it's actually a tractable problem because the probability distribution of sigma of that spin sigma i given the rest is just a symbol, it's just a simple uh, expression. You have here, just, it's just basically, you're just biasing the uniform distribution by this random uh, linear form here, okay? So if I give you the sigmas, you can just compute this easily. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, so in the definition of the model, I use, so both, so it's a icing model with random potentials, but yeah. you resample the potentials each time? No. So, so M, yeah. M so is fixed. Are, M is fixed. M is fixed, but it comes from uh, a random distribution, but you don't do it at every time. So this is given to you. You just know that it was generated in a random fashion. I see. So I should think of this as a, so when you're saying sample from it, are you just saying sample from the Ising model or sample from like first sample a model and then sample from the model? No, sample from the Ising model. So M is okay. given to you and get M stays constant throughout. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Right, so here I described this uh, very nice Markov chain and does it mix? So if it mixes, quickly. So, I mean, it is, a, it is a stationary Markov chain and it satisfies the, delay, de, the detailed balance condition. So it will, we'll know it's going to converge eventually to mu and the stationary distribution is mu. 
but how fast? So does it mix in polynomial time? So if you know about Markov chains, you're perhaps seeing that there is a relationship between the mixing time and the Poincaré inequality. So let me define this. So we say that mu, mu is, a distribu is an arbitrary distribution over the hypercube, satisfies the Poincaré inequality if for every function on the cube that is real valued, the variance of f under the distribution of mu is smaller than one over gamma, the Dirichlet form of f and f for some gamma positive. So let me define these quantities. So the variance is perhaps the easiest one to define is really just the variance. If you just sample sigma from mu and compute the variance of f of sigma. The second uh, expression here is an energy term. This is called the Dirichlet form of f. And this is a, typically a bilinear form, but here we're considering it, we're evaluating it at the same points, which is f. And this is, what is it? So you take an expectation and you sum over all coordinates of this difference, this difference square. So you could look at this as some sort of gradient. So this is the norm, the two norm of a gradient where the notion of the gradient, since here we're in a discrete setting, is fix the, uh, all the coordinates except one of them, take the expectation of f under that randomness of one sign, then subtract f of sigma, then take the square of that. So this is the norm, the two norm of a gradient. Okay, so if this is satisfied for some gamma, we're gonna say that mu satisfies the Poincaré inequality with constant gamma. So there is a classical result that says that if mu satisfied a, satisfies a Poincaré inequality for constant gamma, then Glauber dynamic mixes after the number of steps that is n over gamma, okay, or big O of n over gamma. So whenever gamma is constant, that means that your mixing time is linear in n, which means that you're just, you're just running the algorithm for a linear number of steps and then you converge, okay? So now the question of whether Glauber dynamics converges or mixes in polynomial time just reduces to the question of whether one can prove such an inequality with constant gamma. Okay. So there's a beautiful theorem that appeared three months ago exactly that says that mu satisfies a Poincaré inequality for gamma being one over one minus delta where delta is just the largest eigenvalue of m minus the minimum eigenvalue of m. So if you go back to that semicircle law picture, then you have the lowest eigenvalue is minus two beta. The largest eigenvalue is two beta. So the difference is four beta plus a little term, okay? So what does that mean? It means that global dynamics will mix so that you want this to be, so it's constant. Of course it is constant, doesn't depend on n but you want it to be positive, right? For the, the, the theorem to make sense at all, for the definition to make sense at all. So beta has to be smaller than one over four. Okay, so this tells you that the, the Glauber dynamics mixes in linear time for all beta that is smaller than one over four. And the proof of this theorem is beautiful and elaborate. It's really based on a very beautiful technique that is called stochastic localization. This technique is actually the subject of an intern, intense workshop right now. So in the assignments, we're studying this in depth and trying to try understand this technique and try to extend it. So, but the conjecture turns out that even with this technique, it doesn't give you the right answer. The conjecture is that you have linear time mixing for all beta smaller than one, because that's the entire high, high temperature phase. Whenever there is, you're in high temperature in the definition, according to the definition that I gave you earlier, where beta is smaller than one, then we expect Glauber dynamics to mix in linear time because in this entire high temperature phase, we do not expect any other phase transitions to happen. The landscape of this measure mu should, be, should look the same for all beta smaller than one. So there is no reason to expect that this one fourth is actually critical in any shape or form. So we're trying to make progress on this, on this conjecture currently. And this is so this is the, currently the subjects of an ongoing project. Uh, but meanwhile, so for now, we haven't made a ton of progress on this. So we can improve this by very small epsilons here in the one fourth. And meanwhile, if you're, uh, if you're content with this one fourth, I can show you a way simpler approach than this, this very elaborate approach. So there is a simpler approach that gets the same result and it can actually literally show you the proof on two slides. So if there are no, no questions, I'll show you this very beautiful approach. Quick clarification. So again, when you're saying mu satisfies pi, this is with high probability. Uh, yes. 
Yes, so uh, actually, so mu will satisfy PI with high probability over the matrix M. So this little O of N is, and actually this is a random, this is a random error term that will go to zero in probability. Right, so the main idea here, it's due to Bauer, Schmidt, and Bodino from last year. And it relies on a decomposition of mu into a mixture of products measures. So the measure mu is complicated. Nevertheless, you can decompose it into a mixture of smaller, simpler distributions. And so these guys were not interested in sampling or polynomial time algorithms or anything. They were trying to prove certain functional inequalities that are called log Sobolev inequalities for spin systems. But you can look at their paper and you can extract an algorithm from it. And it's a very simple one. So let me just for now tell you what this is. So if sigma is in, since sigma is in the cube, so the sign sigma i squared is one, you can add a diagonal term to this matrix, any diagonal term without affecting mu, right? Because the diagonal term is trivially constant. It doesn't depend on sigma. So here I'm added a delta times the identity, okay? in order for M to be PSD. So I just, so this is the spectrum of M, okay? Then I'm just shifting it to the right, shift it to the right so that this minus two becomes zero. If minus two becomes zero, then two becomes four, right? So this is the source of this four beta. Okay? So now that you've done this, you know that M is smaller than C, then the inverse of M is greater than C inverse, which means that there, is an exi there exists a symmetric matrix that is PSD, such that M inverse equals B, B inverse plus C inverse I. Okay, so this, uh, this is just saying that if A is smaller than B, then A inverse is greater than B inverse. This is all this is saying. Okay, now I have this potential that looks like a Gaussian. It's a Gaussian density, and I'm gonna write it as a convolution of two Gaussian densities. The first one has covariance B inverse, and the second one has covariance one over C times the identity. Okay, so this is just a, perhaps a non-clear way of writing the following. If you have a random variable that is Gaussian mean zero and, and has covariance M inverse, then you can write it as a sum of two Gaussians that are still mean zero. One has covariance B inverse, and the second one has covariance C inverse, right? So let me just put this here. So what have I done? I just constructed a joint distribution over two random variables now. One of them is sigma and the other one is phi, okay? And the potential, the form of that probability distribution is just this, this whole thing, okay? So because we have this relation, if you marginalize on, on phi here, if I just integrate over phi, I get mu just because of this relation. Here mu zero, by the way, is just the uniform measure. Okay? Please ask me if this is not clear in anything. And I have a doubt about the delta. It feels like, I thought delta is like an external field that you're applying, so. Uh, no, no. So delta is not an external field. Delta is just a constant that um, it doesn't, so it doesn't, affect anything, right? Because sigma, sigma i squared is one. Oh, because it's plus minus, okay. Yeah, because it's plus minus one. So I can just add anything to the diagonal that doesn't affect anything. Okay, so we constructed this joint distribution. Now the conditional distribution of sigma given phi is a product measure. So you can read it from here, this guy will go away and then you can just uh, expand this and you can, would actually get this. So this is just a tilt of the uniform measure. It's a, it's a product measure. So if you give me phi, then sigma has a uh, uniform, uh, not a uniform, a product measure. So the coordinates are independent, okay? Now, what is the marginal of phi uh, from, from this distribution pi? You can just sum over all the sigmas here, okay? Now, if you sum that and you do some algebra, this is really two line of computation, you get a form that looks like this. So you have a quadratic term that has a minus in front of it, and this is a PSD matrix. And you have another potential term that is coordinate wise that is given by this function V that is actually just log cosh 
This is just the log of the hyperbolic cosine of c times x. So this is a simple computation. Now you see that there is a competition between these two terms. So this function is con convex, right? Log cosh is convex. This function is concave. So there's a competition between a concave function between a, yeah between a concave function and between a convex function. Now we can compare their Hessians. So which one will win? The Hessian of this one, since b is PSD, the Hessian of this one is greater than c. If you forget about the minus. So now you can compute the second derivative of phi, of v. Sorry, you can compute that second derivative. You differentiate twice, you get a c squared outside. And whatever remains is one minus, minus tangent hyperbolic tangent squared smaller than one. So the Hessian of this part is smaller than c squared. OK, now which one will win? Nu is log concave. You want this one to win if c is greater than c squared. If this term is not convex enough to overcome the, conv the concavity of this term. OK, that means that Mu, mu is log concave is beta is, is, is smaller than one over four because C is four beta, okay? So now we have a very, very, uh, like de very nice decomposition of the measure mu in terms of a mixture of measures, which are each one is a uh, product measure and the latent variable that gives you the mixing weight is itself log concave. So what is the algorithm? Now, what I can do is I can sample phi first from a new, from its marginal. Since new is log concave, I can use Langevin dynamics, for instance. And I know by earlier theory that for a strongly log concave potential, um, or for a, for a strongly log concave measure, sampling from it with Langevin dynamics will mix in linear time, right? Now, once I get phi, I can sample from the conditional distribution, which by construction is a product measure. So you can just sample each coordinates uh, on its own, doesn't depend on anything. And this is the form of the distribution. It's probably that sigma is one, the one coordinate of sigma is one is just given by this logistic, right? So now this is the algorithm, that's it. So this algorithm will converge, will give you an approximate sample in polynomial time if beta is smaller than one over four. And this method relies on this judicious decomposition. So you're trying to decompose the measure into a mixture of simpler measures, in this case, products measures, where the mixing weights are given by a log concave distribution. So we try to extend this to beta larger than one over four, but seems like our efforts for now haven't gotten very far. So the main question I would ask is, can you decompose, can you get another decomposition? Can you decompose mu into a mixture of tilts like we did? So mu is a mixture of these mu tau's. Mu tau's are the tilts, or I mean, they're, they're, they look like this, right? Sorry, this thing. Such that, and the, mix, the mixing weights that are given by this measure m is easy to sample from. And so m here is basically the equivalent of nu. So nu here was log concave. That means we can, we can sample from it efficiently. And you want this to happen for all beta smaller than one. Quick, okay. quick question, Amit. Where yeah. did you use explicitly that beta is less than one fourth? Yeah, uh, here. So in this argument that I, in arguing that I want mu to be oh, log okay. concave, because otherwise this term will win out and you wouldn't get log concavity. So for now, yeah, so this is the question. And you see that this question is you can, you can ask, you can, you can basically use this as a recursion, right? So I want to sample for F, for F from M easily. So suppose I give you this, this, uh, this decomposition. And what does it mean for M for, to sample from M easily? I want another algorithm. So you can ask to decompose M itself as a mixture of simpler measures and et cetera. So you can have a tree of decompositions. So this kind of approach will show up later when I talk about optimization, that there is a tree decomposition of the measure mu. Okay, so if there are no other questions, I'll move on to optimize, optimization. Please let me know. Does the same trick works if sigma takes more than two values? If sigma takes more than two values. So if, if, sigma, takes, if sigma is not binary, then you cannot add that diagonal. So this is very specific to 
uh, sigma either binary or if it's norm, if it's a vector. So if each sigma i is not plus minus one or itself a vector. And if the, these vectors are in the sphere, if they're on their two norm is one, this still will work. But otherwise this will not work. So this is very specific to this kind of problems. I made so some nice sampling from, from the POTS model is still difficult, I guess. So you wouldn't use this. So there is other work that tries to sample from the POTS model, but the ideas are very, very different. I see. Yeah. Can I ask a question about the sampling? Yeah, please. So your first sampling, you um, sampled sequentially through the, well, you randomly chose one component and, and, and updated that and then went to another component. That's right. Um, I, I'm thinking of sort of iterative methods for linear systems where you can do them one at a time or you can do a whole bunch. Yeah. So your second sampling is doing all of them at once. So I was wondering in the first one, if you, um, you know, fixed your last one and then chose each component based on the previous iterate and sampled each of the components and then iterated, would that also have similar dynamics? Would it also mix in linear time? So, uh, so you're talking about step one, right? Not this, not this algorithm, the previous algorithm. Ah, the global dynamics. So you want to- Right, yeah. so yeah. I want to do sample all the, all the components and then update my sigma and then do it again. So that's, that's, that's uh, I'm not sure I understand. So that's what we were doing, right? So I, I, I get a configuration initially. So you have to initialize in some way. So I give you a vector. Now I choose one component and I update it. Then I choose another component and I update it, right? So what were you suggesting instead of this? Instead of um, doing them sequentially, you, you hold fixed all of the components and then you sample each component based on the previous vector and then you update all of them at once. So ah. you don't do it one by one, you, yeah. you update all of them, which that is will, sort of yeah. a product system somewhat similar to this. So that will give you another Markov chain that is different from this one. It'll right. be slightly more difficult to analyze. I think in practice that should work, but we have, don't have an analysis for that. Yeah. So if you want to prove that uh, Glover Dynamics mixes for that particular, or that algorithm will have linear mixing, then you would have to prove a Poincare inequality for that particular Markov chain. And perhaps that's not known. I don't, I don't, I am not aware of anything that's known for that. Okay, yeah. thanks. Mm -hmm. Ahmed, um, just curious, uh, is there anything fundamentally different about these discrete distributions when beta goes from one quarter to one quarter plus tiny, tiny epsilon? No, uh, yeah, no, that there is, well, at least we believe that there is nothing substantially different. There is nothing fundamentally different between beta equals one fourth and beta equals one half. So it's the same picture. What would go wrong if you tried to use the beta equals a quarter distribution as an important sampling distribution for a quarter plus epsilon? So yeah, great. Um, uh, we don't know how to make that work. So if you try to do that, if you try to increase the temperature in a schedule, that would be like simulated annealing or something like that. But uh, we don't know how to analyze that either. So you would have to prove that every time you, you, mix, you mix quickly, you mix in linear time in order to keep doing that forever. But uh, yeah, we, we, it's not clear how to make the analysis work. It's not, so this technique definitely doesn't work. So you can't do, use this technique. Yeah. Yeah, that, that would be a great way to do it, but we don't know how to analyze it, yeah. So if there are no other questions, I'll move on to um, the second part of the talk, which is about optimization. Okay, so here I slightly change notation. Instead of writing M, I'm writing G, because so if you want to link the two notations, M is equal to beta times G, okay? Here G just has a variance that is one over N instead of beta squared over N. And now instead of considering sampling from the associated Boltzmann measure, I'm considering the problem at zero temperature where beta goes to infinity, in which case the measure concentrates over its global maxima. And now I'm asking just to maximize, to construct or to find one of those global maxima. So I'm asking you to optimize this function, this Hamiltonian H, subject to the, the assignment to be in plus minus one. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here, of course, I mean, 
if I change this space, if this space was just the sphere, for instance, the answer would be immediate. So this, you just look at the first eigenvector of this matrix and you would be done. But on the cube, the problem becomes much richer. It becomes much more sophisticated. So this is called the ground state. Like any sigma that achieves this maximum is called the ground state. So there's a generalization. You don't have to only consider quadratics. You can consider any Gaussian process that has, has this property. I'm going to explain. These are called the mixed p-spin model or the mixed p-spin Hamiltonian. You can consider any Hamiltonian that has the following property that if you look at all these random variables that are indexed by sigma over the hypercube, they form a centered Gaussian process with covariance. When I look at the covariance and I evaluate it at two points, sigma and sigma prime, the outcome only depends on the inner products between sigma and sigma prime, passed through a nonlinearity C. Okay? So these are called mixed P spin models. And the story that I will tell you will apply to all of them. But just for concreteness, I'll just consider this uh, quadratic. Uh, case. So just to give you an example of such a, such a process here, you can consider what's called the three spin model, where instead of considering just two body interactions, you can consider three body interactions. So sigma i, sigma k, sigma j. And here the coefficients are also random. So here you had a matrix g, g i, j. Here you have a tensor that is of order three, g i, j, k. So this will fall into this framework. Okay. But now I'll just restrict my discussion to the quadratic case. OK, so I want to optimize. Can I efficiently find an approximate ground state? <clears throat> so if I just give you the quadratic, you can just store the matrix G and then evaluate gradients or do whatever you want with it. But in general, I can even consider a more restricted model of computation where I only require to have a gradient oracle. By that, I mean there is an oracle that only gives me gradients at any point I query. So I give it a point in the cube or in, in, the, in, the, in my space Rn, and it gives me the Euclidean gradient of the Hamiltonian at that point. And that's, that's all I will need. I will only need gradients. And the task is to output a configuration or a vector that is binary that depends on all my queries such that the energy or the value of the, of the function at that point is at least one minus epsilon times the maximum with high probability. So that means that you're up epsilon close to the optimum. And also I want the number of my queries to be small, to be linear, polynomial at least, at most in n and one over epsilon. Sorry, what does the, um, the gradient mean here in the yeah. context of sigma's discrete? That's a good point. So I didn't explain that. So if you look at the expressions that I wrote down, so this is a this is this is just an algebraic expression. Sigma doesn't have to be on the cube, and the gradient would be just the usual gradient in Rn, the Euclidean gradient, which is g times sigma. Here as well. So you don't have to do anything. You just can can, can compute the grad the Euclidean gradient of that algebraic expression. In general, what you can do is in this, at this level of generality of a Gaussian process on the cube, how do you extend it to Rn? So I'm gonna have to consider an extension of this, of this function to the entirety of Rn, and that's called the harmonic or the multilinear extension. So basically what you do is you just look at product distributions over each coordinate, and the mean of that, the, that distribution is Xi. So look at the distribution on plus minus one, whose mean is xi. Now I'll define the value of this function at the point x, which is just in the cube, in the solid cube, I mean, as being the expectation of h over sigmas that have that distribution, that for, for which each coordinate is plus minus one with mean xi. So that's called the harmonic extension. Now you have a function that is defined on a full space and you take the Euclidean gradient of that. So this is a convoluted way to say that in our case, the gradient is just G times sigma. So 
if you don't assume anything about this problem, if you don't assume that the matrix G is random, this problem is worst case, is NP-hard in the worst case, as I said earlier. This is already for quadratics, this is NP-hard, and not only that, but for an approximation ratio that is very, very small. So already for a bad approximation ratio that is of order one over log N, this is already NP-hard. If you want to give a very bad approximation, that's very difficult. But we don't expect, of course, I'm, I wouldn't be giving this talk if I didn't expect the situation to be much better when I consider random problems. Okay, so what you can do, so let, let me just, just survey some, some approaches that one can hope to uh, make work. You can look at convex relaxations. So just for reference, if you consider this, uh, this maximum over the cube, this is proportional to n, and when you divide by n, there's an asymptotic value that is given by the so-called Parisi formula. And if you evaluate, evaluate it numerically, excuse me, you get this number that is 0.52, approximately 0.52. Now, what you can do is you can relax this constraint. You can relax the constraints that sigma is plus minus one by put it in, putting it on the sphere. So you just relax it for sigma to be in Rn with norm that is the same, that is the two norm of sigma is square root n, which is the same two norm of a binary vector. Now, this is just the spectrum, right? This is just a spectral approach. The top eigenvalue, this is the top eigenvalue of G, and then that's given by the semicircle law that is just the first eigenvalue that is, that is two. That is just the, the, the semicircle that I showed you earlier. So you're far away from this 1.52. Now, what you can do, you can round, right? So once you, once I give you, when, once I compute an optimizer, which is a top eigenvector, if you want to optimize, if you want to, sorry, if you want to give me a vector that is binary, one way to do it is just to take the signs of those, of, of the first eigenvector, right? Optimize this, then take each coordinate individual and take its sign, it will give you a vector that is plus minus one. And now how does it compare with this value 1.52? You can do the analysis, and this has been done a long time ago. So if you look at the, uh, the energy that is achieved by this configuration, it's about 1.27, okay, it's four over pi, which is smaller than this number. So my objective is to give you an algorithm that actually achieves this number exactly. Now, the second approach, you can try to strengthen this relaxation. This is the SDP relaxation that, that is famously known as the Gomez-Williamson Gomez algorithm. You can put the sigma on the other side here. That'll give you G times sigma sigma transpose, the whole thing trace. Then you can, you can replace sigma sigma transpose by a full matrix that is PSD, that is symmetric and PSD, and drop the rank constraints. Sigma sigma transpose was rank one, then you drop the rank constraints, but you keep one constraint that reflects that sigma was binary, namely that sigma i squared is one, then that translates into the constraint that the diagonal of x, xii I, is the identity. xii I, I is one, which means the diagonal is the identity. Now, how does this do? Turns out that this does no better than the spectral bound. This will still give you two as in the spectral, the spectral bound, okay? Now, okay, so let's try to round now, but maybe so, okay, the value is not good, but maybe when we round, when we get a optimal X and try to round it, try to extract a binary vector from it, then maybe you can get closer to this number, 1.52. Okay, so how do we round? You can write, since this is a PSD matrix and diagonal one, you can write it like this as the inner products between, so each, each you know, this is just a, uh, uh, X equals S S transpose kind of decomposition. And each vector S I is in the sphere of radius one. What, what can I do next? I can construct a vector that is drawn uniformly from the sphere. I call it U zero. And then I construct a sine vector sigma, sigma tilde I by looking just an inner product of sigma S I that is given by this decomposition. Multiply it, just take the inner product with this random direction that is U zero and take the sine of that. Okay, so this is also a rounding that has been considered in this, in this seminal paper by Gomez and Williamson. Now I can look at the energy that is achieved by that number, uh, by that uh, procedure. And it turns out surprisingly, it doesn't change. It's exactly the same thing as in the spectral bound, the spectral rounding technique, right? It's still 1.27, the same number. So that doesn't go, we're not making progress here. 
turns out that nothing in this hierarchy of relaxations can do better. And so not, not, okay. So let me just try this for, for degree SOS. So this is this, this approach of doing spectral, then SDP, then there is a next natural next level of the SDP hierarchy that one can consider. These are called the sum of squares hierarchy and they're being studied extensively in the computer science literature. And so this SDP is, can be considered as a level two. And there is a natural level four that one can consider that I didn't write down. It's a complicated one. And there's a theorem of Kuniski and Bandera that says that this will not do better. So the value of SOS4 will still be two, okay? And there is a very strong reason to believe that all degree, constant degree SOS will not beat the spectral threshold, okay? So there is evidence that is based on what is called low, low, uh, low likelihood ratio tests that are uh, low degree likelihood ratio tests that say that spectral bones, the spectral bound is the best computation way possible if you're trying to lower the value by doing convex optimiz by convex uh, relaxations, okay? This is called certification. If you're trying to lower the value by like relaxing the problem and then trying to strengthen uh, the relaxation until you reach the value, that there is a strong belief that two is the best thing you can do. Are there any questions so far? How important is the Gaussian assumption? Yeah. Uh, not much, not very. Um, uh, you can have, um, you can have, uh, so, okay, so this is not a theorem. It's a theorem in the case of the spectral bound. I think it is still a theorem in the case of the first SDP, but it's not a theorem for higher degree SOS. That if G has IID entries that are just uh, uh, centered variance one and enough enough moments, enough finite moments, then the same, same thing will hold. So as long as G satisfies those universal law for yeah, random exactly. matrices. So it is universality is believed here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, so let me tell you about the main result here. So we actually are able to overcome this by not considering relaxations. You're just trying to optimize directly. And so the theorem says that for any epsilon positive, there exists an algorithm that has complexity C of epsilon times n squared. So for any accuracy, desired accuracy epsilon, you can have an algorithm that runs in something that is proportional to a constant times constant that depends on epsilon times n squared, n squared being just the cost of matrix vector multiplication. So basically the algorithm has C of epsilon uh, gradient squared, such that the value that you get is one minus epsilon times the optimum, okay? So there's an assumption behind this and it's an assumption that is, that is, that is believed. Let me, let me just spell it out for you. Is that the Parisi formula at zero temperature is full replica symmetry breaking. If these words don't mean anything to you, let me explain them in the next couple of slides. This is a conjecture in mathematical physics that has been advanced a long time ago and is widely believed to hold. And, but unfortunately, there is no mathematical proof of it. It's actually one of the biggest open problems in that specific area. Okay. So, quick question is, what does the algorithm look like? Yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, that's, uh, I'm gonna, of course, okay, show you the that. algorithm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so let me first explain what this is because I'm gonna need to define the Parisi formula anyway to show you the algorithm. So, the assumption, so what is the Parisi formula? I'm gonna have to first consider what is the value of this optimum? In fact, so there is, this problem is not convex. So how do I certify that I am optimally solving the problem where the problem is not convex? So I need to tell you what the value here is and I try to approximate that specific value in order to say that I'm optimal, right? So what is the value of this? So that value is given by what is called the Parisi formula. So let me just spell it out for you. So I can consider a space of functions that goes from, so gamma is from the interval zero one to the positive real, they're non-decreasing, they're L1. Okay, their integral is finite. You have to solve a PDE. So for any, take a gamma from this space, put it in this nonlinearity, put it here in this PDE, this nonlinear PDE that has a boundary condition from one, that is this one, then solve that PDE, okay? Now consider this functional that takes gamma and then 
its value is take the solution of the PE at the point zero, zero, at time zero and position zero, and subtract this linear term in gamma. So this is a function of gamma. And the theorem says that the maximum divided by n converges to the infimum of this functional over this class. So this is called the Parisi formula. It's a beautiful formula. It's a crowning jewel in probability theory. And there are many, many open problems about it. So just the fact, the mere fact that this formula holds is a mystery. Why does it hold? Why does this maximum turn into an infimum of an extremely complicated problem that is, can be formulated in terms of a nonlinear partial differential equations and, you know, like a variational problem over infinite dimensions. Quick, quick question is what is uh, C again? Is this that nonlinearity uh, yes. of the dot product? Yeah, so C is the nonlinearity that gives you the dot product. But here you can consider C to be X squared over two, in which case uh, Xi second is just one, yeah. So for the specific case of the SK model, C second will be just one. So C second shows up here and here. Okay, so there's a formula, okay. Now what we can do is try to get an algorithm that approximates this formula that gives us, give us a value that is given by this formula. Okay, just so let me explain what is full replica symmetry breaking. Full replica symmetry breaking is just saying that the infimum of this variational formula is given by a strictly increasing function. When you compute this infimum, the infimum is given by a strictly increasing function, okay? We don't know how to prove this. This is an open problem, but you can discretize this variational problem and put it in your computer and you'll find indeed that by simulation, it looks like this, okay? So we actually believe an even simulation so shows that this is the case, but we don't know how to prove it, okay? So this is by definition. What I mean by full replica symmetry breaking is this. Okay, so let me, now let me tell you the algorithm. I showed you the Parisi formula. I showed you what is full replica symmetry breaking. Let me tell you about the algorithm. And this is what we call incremental approximate message passing. So the algorithm has two iterates, two uh, quantities, two vectors that are M and Z that are the most relevant ones. So they're initialized in a certain way. Now the, the, the algorithm behaves recursively. So it, it's an iterative one. And at step L, if you give me the Z's up to time L, I'll put them in a function F. And this function can be arbitrary. Choose your function, your favorite function, and compute these uh, Z's, the, the, this, this, this function, evaluate this function over this, these Z's. It'll give you a, num, a vector M. Now, Take that M and compute the gradient of the Hamiltonian at that point and subtract some linear combination of the previous M's. That will give you the next Z and then do it this again, okay? So there is a, this is a very large class of algorithms because what, however you specify this function F or these functions, this sequence of functions F that will give you a new algorithm. So we can try to analyze all of them and try to get the best choice of these functions f in order to achieve the value that we want, okay? How do we choose these nonlinearities? There is a very beautiful ingredient that is very, uh, that is aesthetically very pleasing and it turns out that is sufficient. And this comes from a lot of, uh, it comes from a deep picture in statistical physics that I don't have to, I can't explain right now. But this says that there, there must be orthogonal updates. So what is the property of, of orthogonal updates? By the way, this property has been only recently exploited algorithmically by Elirant Subag for another problem, related problem. But this has been known in physics for a long time. The orthogonal updates property says that when you look at an increment in the Ms and in the Zs, that should be orthogonal to all the past. So now I want this to be true in my choice, I'm gonna bake this as a constraint in the choice of these functions f, okay? So the ansatz that I will give is the following. I'm changing, reducing the choice of these functions f to a smaller choice a priori, which is the choice of these control vectors or control functions uj, okay? So I'm writing, I'm choosing to instantiate f in this following, in this following way. And you see here that there are increments and then if they're independent of these guys, then the expectation or the inner products of ML 
uh, ml plus one minus ml times mj will be approximately zero. So this is justifies the choice of this of this uh, of this thing. So the high level picture is as follows. Let me not bore you with the details is we're going to start from zero. So we want to converge to one of the corners of the cube. We're going to build a controlled diffusion that starts from the origin and explores a random path towards a corner of the cube. OK, so we're going to steer this vector m. We're going to steer it in a certain way that at the end of the day, it will converge to a corner of the cube. So there is an equivalent description in terms of a tree that's called the ultrametric tree. And this is really related to this decomposition that I showed you about when I was talking about sampling, that the measure mu, which is extremely complicated and lives, lives at the origin here, lives at the root of this tree, can be decomposed in a recursive way into easier, more manageable distributions. But I will not really make that more explicit than this. So now you can do a bunch of computations. You can do a lot of analysis for this kind of algorithm. And then you can actually compute the value that is achieved by this algorithm, and it's given by an optimization problem. So for each u, for each choice of these controls u, I get a value that is this. OK, so now I've written it in continuous time. Because I can let n goes to, go to infinity, then I can let the discretization step of this random walk to go to 0 in order to get a continuum time limit problem. So for every u, I can replace it by a stochastic process ut. And the value that I get is this thing. There are constraints on what that u can be that are, given, that are just given by constraints of the algorithm, that are practical constraints in order to implement the algorithm, that are these two. So now you want to choose u in order to maximize this energy. And that's what I call E star. So the problem of algorithmic design becomes a question of a stochastic control problem. So now the theorem says if there is full replica symmetry breaking, then E star is the Parisi formula, is the ground state. And this is a duality result. So if you're familiar with convex optimization, and I'm sure all of you are, that here I have a maximum, I have a constraint, I can dualize this constraint, pull a, pull a Lagrange multiplier here, try to solve the du compute the dual, the dual turns out to be exactly this. So the maximum turns into an infimum because of this duality. And the question, the earlier question of why the maximum of a Hamiltonian converges to a variational problem that looks like an infimum is actually, actually hidden in this duality. So the duality is why you get, you go from a maximum to an infimum. And it seems that, that that wasn't recognized before. OK, so now at a high level, this is what happens. Now, once you solve this control problem, that will tell you exactly what the optimal u is. And then you can use that u. You can go back and use that u here in your algorithm, and you're done. OK, so this is the very high level uh, scheme, how the algorithm works, and how its proof works, and how its analysis works. OK, now you can implement these things, and we did. These are things that we can implement. And uh, yeah, they, they give you good results. So for instance, if you look at this first figure, you can consider solving the problem for increasing n. So we're going this in this direction, in direction from the right to the left. You can compute the value that is achieved by the algorithm. And that, al algorithm, that value, if you do a simple regression, it'll converge. It'll just point to the right direction. I mean, you can't solve this for a, for a, for a you know, for an inf n equals infinity, because the asymptotic value that we're trying to achieve only holds at n equals infinity, right? But it is, it is very consistent with a finite size scaling that is given by this number, that is n to the minus 2 thirds. That is also, if you know about the fluctuations of the first eigenvalue around the number 2 that is given by the tracy widom law, and this window of those fluctuations are given exactly by this exponent. So that exponent is believed to be universal. And this should also hold for the SK model, although there is no proof of that. So there's a beautiful open, open problem. But you can see it in simulation. And that gives you a, a somewhat accurate, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty accurate that you get exactly the value that, uh, that is given by the theory. And also, I wanted to show you another picture, which is the behavior of the coordinates of the current vector m that you, that you have. You start from the origin, as I told you, and I, you do a diffusion, and hopefully you'll get a, you reach a corner of the cube. So each one of these trajectories is a coordinate i, so m1, m2, m3, et cetera. And you see how such, so they, they fluctuate. And at some point, they have to settle on either plus or minus 1. 
And at the end of the day, so at time one, you get an actual binary, very close to binary solution. Okay, so this is the algorithm just does this controlled diffusion where at some point it has to settle on one sign, either plus one or minus one. Okay. Okay, so I think I'm at the end of the talk. I want to tell you about some interesting future directions here. Uh, if there are any, no, pro, no, no questions first about this optimization, then I'll move on. Okay. Um, can, yeah. Quick question. Can I use the algorithm in the context of the Montanari and Sand paper, which looks at the stochastic block model and uh, yeah. stuff? Right, so uh, I was gonna talk about that as a future direction work. <laughs> so uh, yes, yes, uh, short answer is yes, but just wait one minute and I'll tell you. Sure. <laughs> so you've explained things in terms of this uh, strong duality result. Yeah. Is weak duality something simple and understandable? Uh, weak duality would be when you don't have equality, but you have an inequality. Well, for any feasible solution, um, any feasible sigma and any feasible gamma that you have that inequality. Right. Is that trivial to see? Um, no, it is not. Um, so there is a lot of work hidden behind proven equality or even inequality. Um, so if you know, so here's, this is a stochastic control problem, then what you can do to solve it, you can do dynamic programming. Now write down your dynamic program then try to convert it into a hamilton jacobi bellman equation that will give you a nonlinear PDE that describes the evolution of the, of, the, of the solution to this control problem. Then what you can do here from there, you can convert this hamilton jacobi bellman equation into the Parisi PDE via change of variables. So once you do that change of variables, you'll end up with something that looks like the Parisi formula and you have to do the right change of variables. So there is some work there. There is some technical work in terms of PDE theory and variational calculus that you have to put it, put in in order to get an inequality. Now, where does the equality come in? The equality is saturated if you have full replica symmetry breaking. Basically, what you need to have is that the minimizer is strictly increasing so you can compute variations over it. You can compute, you can wiggle it a little bit in order to compute first order stationarity conditions in order for this constraint to hold. Okay, and that's how you get the equality. So maybe this is a very high level and didn't probably didn't make much sense, but uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I was just interested in inequality and just for the Parisi formula, is the inequality easier to see? Uh, no, no, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's really not. <laughs> it's okay. The, yeah, it's <laughs> really the same, uh, the same arguments. It's, uh, the inequality is just as hard as the equality. <laughs> and okay. the last step when you go from inequality to, e to equality is, uh, is requires this, right. this assumption. Sure. Yeah, that's, uh, that's all. All right, so the next problem that I'm excited about that I want to discuss is this thing that is called the perceptron problem. And it's also in computer science, it's also called discrepancy minimization. It's the following problem. You have Gaussian vectors that are IID that are of size N. And I require, so the the formulation of the problem asks you to find a vector that is either binary or on the sphere. So these are two variants of the same problem, such that these, these inner products in absolute value are smaller than a constant times square root n. So if you're familiar with discrepancy, there is this famous result by, by Spencer, Joel Spencer, that says that no matter what the, the g's are, these g's are, they just need to have a norm, norm one. They have to have a L2 norm one you can find a sigma such that this is true for some kappa. Turns out that if you assume that the g's are random, you can hopefully do better. And in particular, you can try to make these, this existential statement algorithmic. You want to find an algorithm, an efficient algorithm that finds you a, a sigma uh, that satisfies all of these constraints for a number of constraints that is proportional to n. Okay. so. Physicists, again, they have a theory of when this problem is possible, what is, what is the solution, the geometry of the solution space, and it remains to exploit it in the same way as if we exploited the geometry of the measure mu in order to optimize it or sample from it. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, an avenue of research that we're trying to explore currently. 
The next problem is one that uh, you don't talk about that mentions is a problem of max cut or mean bisection on a random regular graph. If I give you a graph and I ask you to partition it into two communities, equally sized communities, such that the cuts in between those communities is minimal, or I don't, so that's the mean bisection problem. Or for the max cut problem, it's slightly a different one. I don't require the two communities to be equally sized, but I require that the cut in between them is maximal instead of minimal. So these problems are somewhat related. Now, if the graph is random and regular with constant degree, we do not know how to do this in, with an algorithm. Obviously, of course, if you know about a little bit about worst case theory for this kind of problems, this max cut is an NP-hard problem, which means that you cannot expect to do this for arbitrary G. But for certain graphs, and hopefully for random regular graphs, we can still do this. And hopefully we can use some version of this algorithm, but adapt it to the sparse case in order to solve this type of questions. So that's another direction of interest that I'm trying to explore currently. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions. Thanks, any questions? I guess since you mentioned the discrepancy, so the Lovett um, Meka algorithm at a high level seems similar in that they're also doing a diffusion on the hypercube. Yeah, so uh, yeah. Do you know any connections? That's a very good question. No, um, it, it looks suspiciously similar, but we do not know how to link these two approaches. It's, uh, that's, that's one question that has been in my mind like two weeks ago probably, and I was thinking about it, but it's not clear. So when you look at their algorithm, it's simpler than this. But also there's another way in which these things don't match. It's, this, is, this is extremely specialized. So I'm exploiting these very intricate structures that are given by the Parisi formula. But in their case, since they're working with worst case instances, there is no reason where to, why you would expect something like this to, to hold, right? There's no Parisi formula, there's nothing like that. So why would the same approach work? Uh, it's a mystery, I don't know. Um, it, it's, uh, it, this is still a question that, that is very interesting and we do not understand it. I'm curious what you're hoping for, for a discrepancy result. What, I mean, what, what would you like to do that's beyond, uh, for in the random case, that's beyond what people have done in the worst case? Right, so, so worst case, I guess, so the, the, the result of Joel is, is existential, but a lot of people have worked into making it algorithmic. Yes. Right, but, so, but algorithmic it up to what degree, right? So if I choose kappa and alpha that are, for which I guarantee you that there is a solution, can you find it? Worst case is not, we, as far as I know, worst case analysis does not allow you to do anything like that. Yeah, I mean, there's some nice results out there. I, I don't know what the limits of them are, but. Uh... Uh, yeah, so, right, so here it would be, so choosing these randomly would allow you to actually go beyond what's possible with worst case analysis. For instance, okay. I can consider kappa being constant and alpha being constant, and I would still be able to find a solution where in worst case analysis, I am not sure a result like this is, is correct. Uh, sure, let's, let's, uh, maybe it would be good for us to talk a little bit more offline. Yeah, um, I wouldn't mind. The other, other thing is that um, uh, it, I found this diffusion result kind of interesting because there's been uh, sort of replications of the random hyperplane rounding for max cut that now are looking at, at diffusion as opposed to the, the random hyperplane method to get these worst case analyses. Uh, so can you point me to our, what, was the, what is the keyword there? Uh, the keyword. Yeah, um, like if there is anything I can look at, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll send you a link to a paper. Sounds good, yeah, thank you. I'm not aware of that. I know these things that are called Kriven diffusions, if you heard of yes, them. Yes, no, those ones, that's this, right. Right, so there's Asaf Noor and Ronan Eldan that are trying to, 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 to exploit those. So this, this is related, joins uh, Sid's question. So there are these results that like, use these diffusions in a way that kind of suspiciously like look like this one, but in the worst case scenario and yes. somehow they work. But it's, yes. it's really an interesting question. Why and is there a connection? That's very interesting. I, I don't know, yeah. Sure. Thank you, thank you for the talk. Yeah, thank you. So I guess if you ran like gradient descent on this, it would fail like very, very quickly, right? Yeah, yeah, so, we, so you, can, you can actually analyze it. Um, gradient descent will fail 
So it'll give you an energy that is proportional to n. So you'll still get something that is completely non-trivial, but the coefficients, I wanted, I wanted the right coefficient. I wanted that 0.52. It will not give you the 0.52. It'll give you something strictly smaller. And that's understood. I think that's understood. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And in, in, your, in the suggested algorithm, it, I saw uh, that the increments were orthogonal. So does that limit how many steps does your algorithm take at most? Yeah, right. So it'll, like, you, you, there's only so much room in a space of n dimensions. So yeah. in particular n steps. But uh, the algorithm takes a constant number of steps. So okay, constant in n, but not constant in epsilon. So the number of steps only depends on epsilon the accuracy that you want. Mm -hmm. And it depends on it like one over epsilon squared. Mm -hmm. And if you run it all the way to n, you'll get the exact. Uh, so no, that's, not, that's not clear. So um, if you run it all the way to n, I'm not even sure that the, uh, the theory will still hold there. So the analysis that we do is two steps. So you send n to infinity, then the number of steps to infinity. Hmm. But uh, uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I need to think about this, whether it's so old or not. But uh, yeah, at some point it has to break. But uh, yeah. Interesting. Well, can you give a sense of where you use the monotonicity, the replica yeah. symmetry breaking? Right. Um, so let's think about a convex problem that is constrained by linear inequalities. Let's think about an LP that is constrained or like a quadratic, quadra optimize a quadratic. Uh, constrained to uh, linear inequalities. If the optimum is in the interior of the polytope, then it's easy to do your duality. Like the constraints will all be strictly satisfied. But now if you're, you're, the optimal point hits the boundary, right? Then one of the constraints, like, you know, one of the constraints will not be satisfied. Like, so do you want an equality constraints, but you relax it to an inequality constraints, and if they're all satisfied, that means that the equality constraints in particular are satisfied. But if you hit the boundary of the, of the polytope, that means that your equality constraints that you started with will not be satisfied. Does that make any sense? A little bit. I'm using the RSP condition somehow ensures that the solution is... Is in the interior. In the yeah. So, and it's because of duality, because basically, so you have like an equality constraints and equality constraints and you relax it, but then you want to recover it. Once you do the relaxation, you want the relaxation to be tight. So that's the optimal point has to be in the interior of your, of your feasible sets. Uh, I guess Ahmed will be joining us in, in January, possibly in Ithaca, possibly in Berkeley, not clear yet. Yeah. And uh, you can reach out to him by email if you want to set up another meeting to talk, which would be a great idea. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I like, your talk. Yeah. please ask me, please send me emails about anything you want to learn more about or anything. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation.